Welcome, one and all, and thank you for participating in our first ever ECH week. My name is Daniela Gundorj, and I'm the Vice President of Academic Affairs for the Conflict Studies and Human Rights Association. Together with the Center for International Policy Studies, the Faculty of Social Sciences, our association has planned a whole week of events from panel discussions to a gender identity workshop, documentary event, lectures on indigenous rights, and much more. On that note, we would like to acknowledge that this land remains unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory, and we remain grateful and respectful of that fact. I would like to remind everyone to please turn off their phones or any other disruptive devices. Tonight's keynote address, presented by Alex Neve, will be followed by a question and answer period, where you may proceed to ask your questions at the microphones at the side. Please join us afterwards for cocktails and light refreshments, which will be served following the presentation. Just to note that this will be a cash bar. I will now take a brief moment to introduce Catherine Liston Hayes, who will then welcome Alex Neve to the stage. Professor Liston Hayes is an economist by training with degrees from the University of Ottawa and McGill University. From 1993 to 2011, she has been a member of the faculty at the School of Management at Royal Holloway College, University of London, where she, had, where she was a PhD director and subsequently head of its accounting, finance, and economics group. Her research is invariably motivated and anchored in real public policy questions and controversies. And in addition to academic work, she has advised the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development on regulatory transport matters. She has extensive experience on teaching university level executive and professionals in London, Hong Kong, New York, and Singapore. She is currently the director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs here. Without further ado, I present Catherine Liston Hayes. Sorry, last time I spoke in front of people, I forgot those, right? So I'm not doing that again. D'abord, j'aimerais remercier le comité organisateur du programme en droit humain et études de conflit d'avoir organisé cette semaine d'événements avec la co collaboration de CIPS. And what a great idea to begin this SEASH week with a talk from Alex Neve. As many of you know, Amnesty International is a global movement of over 3 million people in more than 150 countries, working together to protect and promote human rights. It is an impartial organization whose only goal is to ensure human rights are respected for everyone, everywhere. Alex Neve has been an active member of this organization since 1985, taking up different roles at the international and national level. He is currently Secretary General of the English-speaking branch of Amnesty International Canada, a position he has held since 2000. Unsurprisingly, he has participated in many international missions around the world, perhaps too many to name here. I was clearly told to keep it under five minutes. But perhaps it is worth mentioning that he has represented Amnesty International at the Summit of the Americas and the G8 Summit, appeared before numerous Canadian parliamentary committees, as well as various UN and inter-American human rights bodies. Upon discussing our pre uh, prestigious guests with colleagues, that are all in the know about human rights development, I am told that perhaps more than any other member, Alec has been instrumental in exposing Canada's own human rights issues. As primary spokesman of the, of the English branch, he has had considerable impact on the way Canadians think of their own human rights record. Alex is a frequent contributor in the media and a very busy public speaker. He also had a stint of lecturing on human, uh, international human rights and refugee law at Osgoode Hall Law School. He was named an officer of the Order of Canada in 2007. Luckily for us, he finds it hard to say no to David Petrasek, <laughs> so we also get Alex involved in our MA Capstone seminars. 
and in a selection of activities such as this one tonight to the benefit of our student, staff and wider audience. We are very fortunate that his office is around the corner from us and that he finds David so very persuasive. Alex's presentation this evening is entitled Protecting Refugees, It's a Human Rights Issue. His speech will focus on the restrictive policies of certain countries toward refugees and how their human rights must maintain, remain a priority. So Mr. Neve, I will stop now after simply stating what an honour it is to have you with us tonight. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. You realise you've now set me up to have to be very cantankerous with David. He's going to have a very hard time getting a yes from me now. <laughs> uh, but it's a real pleasure uh, to, uh, to be here this evening and to have an opportunity uh, to share with you, certainly uh, there are a multitude of human rights issues that are very close to my heart. Uh, but my very early days as a human rights lawyer, uh, as a member of Amnesty International and, and a whole variety of other uh, ways that I became involved in the human rights struggle were focused uh, on refugee issues. Uh, and, um, and so it's, it's a human rights issue that I feel particularly concerned and passionate about. And these are important, troubling times, including very much for us uh, as Canadians. So I look forward to having an opportunity to explore some of that with you. Uh, tous les êtres humains naissent libres et égaux en dignité et en droit. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. I'm sure you all know that those are the simple and eloquent opening words of Article 1 of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It takes us back to December the 10th, 1948. And over 65 years later, those 12 short words are still stirring and certainly deeply meaningful. It isn't, however, where we ordinarily begin when turning our minds to vexing and complicated questions about refugee protection and refugee rights. More instinctively, we reach for the UN's words three years later, the 1951 Refugee Convention. And there, the opening eloquence and principles don't exactly trip off the tongue with the same sense of inspiration and conviction. Here, Article 1 begins very technically. For the purposes of the present convention, the term refugee shall apply to any person who has been considered a refugee under the arrangements of 12th May 1926 and 30th of June 1928. No doubt about it, the convention misses a chance to open with a bang, with a strong affirmation of the core values that shape what it is to be a refugee and to unequivocally position refugee protection in the world of human rights. A consequence of human rights failure, an imperative response to human rights suffering, a powerful tool for preventing further human rights abuse, and dealing with a group whose vulnerability to ongoing human rights violations is so extreme. Et dans le monde d'aujourd'hui et dans le Canada d'aujourd'hui, nous avons besoin très certainement de la vision et des valeurs quand il s'agit de la protection des réfugiés. Nous devons rappeler que la protection des réfugiés est complètement une question de droits humains. Car nous ne vivons pas dans un temps de la générosité, de la compréhension et de la compassion pour les réfugiés. De plus et plus, nous sommes confrontés à la suspicion, l'impatience et la mesquinerie. Nous perdons la vision. Nos gouvernements sapent les valeurs. Alors quel meilleur moment pour revenir à ces mots de la Déclaration universelle. Tous les êtres humains, libres et égaux, en dignité et en droit. Cela parle de réfugiés. Cela parle des pays dans lesquels les personnes sont déplacées à l'intérieur ou les pays de lesquels ils cherchent à fuir. 
cela parle des pays sur la route. Et certainement, cela parle aux pays où les réfugiés arrivent avec leurs espoirs à trouver la paix et la sécurité. In research campaigning and legal work I've been part of, both in Canada and abroad, I have been reminded time and again that people who have been displaced, people who are fleeing, people who are seeking a better life are far too often not considered to be free and equal, and that governments and societies far too readily denigrate their dignity and disregard their rights, and that our efforts to stand with them and uphold their rights must lie in those affirming, all-inclusive opening words of the Universal Declaration. Let me take you on a bit of a global tour, and I want to start by considering three very different instances that have marked my work over the last couple of years. Over these past two years, I have been part of two amnesty research missions along the very volatile and contested border between Sudan and the world's newest nation, South Sudan. As many of you likely know, South Sudan was born out of a lengthy, very violent and devastating struggle for rights and ultimately for independence. But nationhood, a country only two and a half years old now, has not brought peace and well-being. And that has certainly been so over the past month now as the country has teetered on the brink of full-out civil war and a wave of political and ethnic violence has led to the deaths of as many as 10,000 people. Among the many lingering grave human rights concerns, two states in what is left of Sudan proper have become the sites of overwhelming human rights and humanitarian tragedies, Southern Kordofan and Blue Nile. In the Sudan peace deal, they were not promised the independence that South Sudan eventually opted for, but they were promised popular consultations to consider their place within Sudan, which were widely hoped to be opportunities for greater autonomy and freedom and greater human rights protections. The consultations never came. Discontent grew, people organized, mobilized, spoke out, they demanded that the government live up to its promises, and some turned to arms. And in a country that had known decades of civil war and was still awash in AK-47s, mortars, grenade launchers, that was obviously foreseeable. The Sudan People's Liberation Army, the SPLA, that had fought for decades for independence was reconstituted, this time with the letter N for North, added to the end. And Sudan's response was brutal, never famous by any means for carefully targeted military operations that seek to avoid or minimize civilian casualties, quite the opposite. Sudan's armed forces seem generally determined to maximize civilian toll, well evidenced in their signature tactic of aerial bombardment from Antonov aircraft, with bombs literally rolled out the back and left to land where they may. The impact on the ground has been horrific. Thousands and thousands have been killed or badly injured. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced eternally and well over 250,000 have fled across the border into South Sudan as refugees. Hunger grows because the relentless, indiscriminate bombing means that no one can go to the fields and at the same time the Sudanese government refuses to allow outside humanitarian aid into the region to provide food relief. Well, my work in this roiling border area has focused in particular on the situation in southern Kordofan. And of the many heartbreaking dimensions to the crisis, High on the list is the plight of refugees who have fled from southern Kordofan into harsh, unimaginably desolate and isolated areas of South Sudan. And there they've settled in, the bulk of them, in a camp called Yida, just 15 kilometers over the border. 
And there they have regrouped, recovered, and rebuilt, but there has been controversy. UN agencies, particularly the UNHCR and donor governments, have argued that Yida is too close to that volatile border, particularly because it lies along a strategic corridor along which troops and supplies can and do pass. They've therefore told the refugees, who now number near 100,000, this is not a small group, you must move. First, they were encouraged to move to a site some two hours further south, away from the border, but it was in a lowland area that becomes a virtual swamp during the rainy season. In fact, for several months, it's virtually submerged. Unsurprisingly, understandably, the refugees weren't interested in living in a swamp for one third of the year. And at the same time, we're actually finding life in Yida to be just fine. So then a new plan, a different site. It too is close to the border, but not along that same strategic quarter. So the UN considers it to be a safer location. Safer by one measure, but not by another measure, and it's that other measure which concerns refugees the most. The Sudanese side of the border, near the Yida location, is controlled by the opposition, the SPLA-N, who the refugee population view as their protectors. The Sudanese side of the border, near the new site, is controlled by the Sudanese armed forces, who the refugee population, understandably, consistently describe as the enemy. Well, I interviewed many refugees at Yida about the new proposal, and it comes as no surprise, I did not find one who wanted to move. Instead, I once again heard opposition which ranged from anguished disbelief that it was even being proposed to militant defiance. A young woman named Hana Matar made a particular impression on me. And I want to share with you an excerpt from my notes that I took while I was interviewing her, in which a translator was sharing her very fiery and very thoughtful words, because it picks up on a theme that I want to come back to a couple of times during my remarks. I thought being a refugee was all about being kept safe from your enemy, but they want us to move back closer to our enemy, close enough that they can scare us, attack us, and even kill us. Is that how you treat refugees? And this is the theme that I think is really important. Aren't we the ones who know best where we will be safe? Aren't we the ones who get to make the decisions about where to live, how to feed and shelter our kids? We might end up being here for several years. This is where we are living now. But instead of seeing us as people, it seems like they simply view us as numbers and statistics on their lists or X's on their maps. The message is that we refugees don't have the same rights as others when it comes to deciding where and how we will live and raise our kids. It isn't our decision. Well, there's a lot in Hannah's words, but above all, it's a very strong reminder of how so much of refugee protection relies on policies and makes decisions that sideline and disempower refugees themselves and, in doing so, disregard and weaken protection of their rights. Let me switch far from that isolated corner of East Africa and bring it close to home, right to home. Last year, the Canadian government made an announcement that had been expected for quite some time. For the purposes of refugee determination in Canada, Mexico was designated to be a so-called safe country of origin such that refugee claimants coming from Mexico would no longer be treated the same as refugee claimants from other countries. Not just Mexico, 36 other countries were on that same designated list, including several Central European countries where Roma communities face entrenched discrimination and frequent violence. Well, this isn't just a trivial bureaucratic matter. It is a designation with serious consequence. For as a Mexican claimant on that list, you will not be allowed to appeal a rejection of your claim. You will lose, in fact, you will never have eligibility for medical and health services. This in a country which is in the midst 
of a full-blown human rights crisis. Amnesty International has issued report after report in the last few years. There's been one recent lengthy report about how rampant and gruesome torture has become in Mexico in recent years, another one that looks at increasing numbers of enforced disappearances. We speak of violence against women, brutal treatment of migrants, threats and attacks against journalists and human rights activists, a range of abuses against indigenous peoples in the country, but no real and obvious need to be a refugee from all of that, apparently, under Canadian policy. So we will deal with you in a streamlined way that puts to aside troublesome rights guarantees that ensure you will be treated fairly and in a manner equal to others. This is just one example of a new punitive spirit that has begun to seep into Canadian refugee law. Categories of refugees and migrants more widely singled out and treated in discriminatory ways. Treated differently because of your nationality, be it Mexico, Central European countries with Roma communities, or other countries now designated as safe. Or treated differently because of how you arrive in Canada. Those coming to Canada by boat, for instance, and with the aid of a smuggler, are likely now to face mandatory detention. Not possible, not likely, but mandatory detention, with limited opportunities to seek release from detention. And not because of something troubling about that individual's own background or activities or profile, but simply on the basis of who they traveled with and how they arrived. Those same refugees are also likely to face agonizingly long delays in being reunited with family or being allowed to travel outside Canada, even if their claims are ultimately accepted. You'd think the positive decision would suddenly kind of reset your case and wipe the slate clean, but the punitive spirit remains. There are also punitive provisions now singling out refugees who may have a brush with the law, both relatively minor and more serious offenses. And like the rest of us, it happens. Refugees do have brushes with the law. They're no more or less perfect than any of the rest of us. But Bill C-43, the notoriously named Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act, is now law and it strips some refugees of crucial appeal rights if ordered deported because of criminality. Clearly, more and more in Canadian refugee and immigration law, the Universal Declaration's promise of equality in human rights protection is eroding. That has certainly come into focus over the past couple of weeks in the public debate about the federal government's decision two years ago to slash significantly its long-standing refugee health care program. All refugee claimants were cut off from coverage for medication, vision, and dental care. Going further, refugee claimants coming from countries on that so-called safe countries of origin list are cut off from any health care, except if they are a public health risk. So it doesn't matter if they face ill health, if they may die, the federal government will only cover their health care needs if they are a risk to the health of others. As I said, that's the same list that includes Mexico. Well, what brought this into the public eye recently, I'm sure many of you followed this, was Ontario Health Minister Deb Matthews' decision to step in and ensure that those refugee claimants cut off from the health care they need in Ontario are not left to suffer and can access the treatment they require. She also made it clear that she's going to be sending the bill for that to Ottawa. I don't think I'd want to take any wagers as to how likely it is that she'll ever see that account settled. Ontario follows several other provinces which have done similarly. And I think that's a real measure of how refugee law is unfolding in this country. Provinces who are by no means in a time of rolling in money, looking for ways to spend more money, are one after another stepping up to the plate and putting millions, tens of millions of dollars on the table to make sure that this terrible rights violation gets remedy. And let's not forget that there are 
a number of important rights on the line. Rights related to health care, obviously, to refugee protection, but also to freedom from discrimination. Laid out in numerous binding treaties that Canada signed decades ago, and not just the Refugee Convention. But the government certainly didn't exhibit any concern about this being a human rights matter. Minister Alexander chided Minister Matthews for stepping into federal jurisdiction. That was his big concern. And that, at best, is a debatable point, given that the federal government, yes, may be responsible for immigrants and refugees under the Constitution, but of course, provincial governments are responsible for health. But that's beside the point. What matters is protecting rights, not picking a constitutional squabble. He also contended this was objectionable because it interfered with the government's reform agenda, which is focused on clamping down on, quote, bogus refugees. Yet another dangerous instance of a senior political figure irresponsibly bandying about the inflammatory notion of bogus refugees in ways clearly calculated to erode public concern or sympathy for their plight. And he referred to it with such certainty that the public would be forgiven for concluding that bogus refugees must be some sort of well-established legal category laid out and precisely defined in international treaties and national laws. Of course it is not. It is a pejorative, empty term which really has no other meaning than the refugees we do not want to accept, the refugees whose rights we feel entitled to disregard. Maybe because they told a lie, maybe they come from a country we don't want to offend, or traveled using means we don't like, didn't have an up-to-date passport, committed a crime, had a claim that didn't fit the technicalities of the refugee definition, applied for welfare, or because the harm they fled is about jobs and enough food to eat, rather than imprisonment and torture. Well, some of those situations may be reasons to deport someone, maybe even to send them to jail. Others should lead to compassion, not scorn. None justify violating rights. No amount of bogus rhetoric changes that. A third snapshot. A reminder that when it comes to forced displacement, those who have fled their homes but remain internally displaced within their country often face the greatest dangers. Last year I was part of an amnesty mission to Côte d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, in West Africa. A human rights crisis there for more than a decade unleashed massive displacement, both IDPs, internally displaced persons, and refugees. At a peak three years ago, in fact, one and a half million people had been forced to flee from their homes. But by early 2012, the bulk of internally displaced, at least, had returned home. But there were a group of about 5,000, still fearful for a variety of reasons, who continued to live in a UN-run camp in the west of the country, the region that has seen the greatest volatility throughout the country's long crisis. And Nabli camp was a sore point with the local population who wanted it to be closed so that life could, as they saw it, get back to normal. And in July 2012, the situation exploded. Early one morning, a mob of around 1,000 from the neighboring town of Dweque, bearing all manner of arms, overran the camp. An untold number of IDPs were killed on the spot, shot, hacked with machetes, or burned to death. Hundreds were injured. The camp itself was totally destroyed, razed to the ground. Everyone fled. Many were then rounded up by security forces who had clearly given a nod to the attack as they tried to flee. Dozens disappeared and were summarily killed later. I've been back to the country twice to investigate what happened at Nabli, and we've compiled a picture of what transpired in what was, by any description, 30 frenzied, chaotic minutes of devastating violence. But what I particularly want to share with you this evening is that the more we have digged, it has become so apparent that at the root of this terrible tragedy has been that suspicion, derision, 
and I even say hatred, that refugees and displaced people increasingly face all over the world. Trop de fois, quand j'ai interviewé des villageois, des soldats, des responsables gouvernementaux, et certainement des survivants, ces sentiments ont été exprimés. Il était temps de fermer le camp parce que les habitants étaient la source de toute la criminalité dans la région. Il était temps de fermer le camp parce que les gens sont là juste pour qu'ils puissent obtenir de l'aide des Nations Unies, même s'ils si n'ont pas vraiment besoin. Il était temps de fermer le camp car les déplacés mettent en place leur propre marché et volaient des clients de nos marchés. Il était temps de fermer le camp parce que c'est là-bas où les maladies commencent. Évidemment, les enjeux sont différents, mais pas loin des tendances et des sentiments devant des termes comme « bogus » dans le débat sur la politique d'asile au Canada. La tragédie de Nabli nous montre, dans une façon sinistre et terrifiante, ou que la dérision, les stéréotypes et, finalement, la haine contre des réfugiés et des déplacés peuvent nous conduire. Et ce que j'ai trouvé particulièrement tragique dans le travail que j'ai fait autour de la tragédie Nabli était l'indifférence et l'inaction du gouvernement à la suite de la tragédie. Si cela avait été un village pas un camp, mais un village de 5000 personnes avec des centaines de morts et blessés graves, avec tout le village totalement détruit, y aurait-il une réaction comme hmm, vraiment triste, mais peut-être pour le mieux dans le long terme? Pas d'effort à aller au cours de ce qui s'est passé. Pourquoi est-il arrivé? Qui est responsable? Il a été si évident pour moi qu'il y a une attitude que la situation est différente et moins grave parce que ces personnes ont été déplacées. Ils ne vivaient pas dans des véritables maisons, dans un véritable village. Leur vie a été déjà perturbée et précaire et c'était juste un autre chapitre. Well, I've shared those three very different reflections with you. Refugees shunted about in South Sudan, punitive laws and policies in Canada, and IDPs as second-class citizens in Côte d'Ivoire to frame two key messages. First, the rights of refugees and the internally displaced are at risk right around the world. This is a global story. And second, there are crucial ways that we can and must strengthen our efforts to stand up to what is an assault, not only to fundamental principles of refugee protection, but to the bedrock notion that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Let's survey the landscape a bit more widely. The world certainly continues to be a dangerous and unwelcoming place for refugees, migrants, and those made homeless by human rights abuses, millions of people forced into the margins by a toxic mix of war, poverty, and dogmatic geopolitical gamesmanship. In recent years, the scale of global displacement has grown yet again. The numbers had been going down for a little while. UNHCR's current figures point to 10 and a half million refugees and close to 18 million IDPs in the world. And those later, latter figures are almost certainly way below the true figures as it is notoriously difficult to accurately count IDPs. One of the big stories within those figures, of course, is Syria. Over just three years now, Syrian displacement has exploded. Two and a half million refugees, six and a half million IDPs, and growing. It's getting close to being one half of the population of Syria. And the impact of hosting two and a half million refugees has of course been considerable for Syria's neighbors. 
The numbers in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, northern Iraq are immense, and concerns about their safety and well-being mount daily. There are frequent reports of Syrians either being denied entry or being sent back to Syria. The conditions in overcrowded refugee camps are marked certainly by hardship and peril. Palestinian refugees fleeing from Syria are facing particular difficulties and severe discrimination. And just as we come to grips with how woefully underfunded the UN's most recent appeal for assistance for refugees and IDPs is, the UN launches a plea for even more money. Governments, including Canada, do continue to provide increasing levels of funding to these frontline states, but it is not keeping pace with the needs, and it must be ramped up considerably, not just when a minister or a prime minister decides to take a regional tour and is looking for photo ops. That international responsibility is all the greater given the ongoing disgrace of failed international efforts to address the armed conflict and widespread human rights violations on the ground in Syria that is the cause, of course, of such massive levels of displacement in the first place. One piece of the needed generous and multifaceted solution lies in resettling refugees. Not huge numbers, but significant numbers. And particularly vulnerable at-risk refugees, such as those who have been raped, tortured, children on their own, mothers on their own, the elderly, disabled. It has been truly astounding to see the miserly response of states, including Canada, which in the past have usually stepped up to the plate with robust resettlement programs. This time, we have only agreed to resettle 200 through government sponsorship and another 1,100 through private sponsorship, religious groups and others. And at that, there's no effort to expedite the processing. Most recent estimates are that many of those 200 government-sponsored Syrian refugees may not even arrive in Canada until well into next year. Other countries have been slow as well. And thus, it comes as no surprise that many Syrians, desperate to make it beyond the squalor and hardship of camps in the region, have taken to rickety, overcrowded boats and tried to make it across the Mediterranean. And the prospect of something better, something safer in Europe, but as we know, and I'm going to come back to this, the Mediterranean has instead become a deadly graveyard for hundreds and hundreds of refugees, including many, many Syrians. We are at long last seeing this begin to open up in some European countries. Sweden and Germany have been implementing more generous responses for quite a few months now. And last week, the UK announced it is going to launch a substantial program for resettling vulnerable Syrian refugees. Maybe that will inspire something similar here. But there's no talk of it yet. Let's switch to another region of the world. You know, one, one of the stories um, that gets, I guess, sort of overshadowed within those staggering figures of six and a half million Syrian IDPs is that Colombia, for the first time in years and years, is no longer the country with the highest levels of internal displacement in the world. Imagine, five million IDPs means you come in at number two. But in Colombia, too, that's a number that continues to grow. And many of those displaced recently are indigenous peoples who are facing a true human rights emergency in the country. In fact, one third of Colombia's indigenous nations are currently at risk of extermination. Those are notable figures for us to keep in mind as Canada, because our country continues to deepen its relationship with Colombia on a number of fronts, not always so laudatory. Last year, for instance, Canada added Colombia to the list of countries to which Canadian companies can sell fully automatic assault weapons, with a press release, government press release, proudly noting that this, quote, opens new market opportunities by providing residents of Canada with the opportunity to explore and compete for contracts in Colombia. More widely, a free trade deal has been in place between Canada and Colombia for more than two years now. 
Under that deal, Canada is supposed to table a report assessing the human rights impact of the trade agreement by May 15th every year. May 15th, 2012, report tabled, but no human rights assessment. The government said it was too early to conduct such an assessment. May 15th, 2013, the report did include some human rights analysis, but it was really nothing short of a sham. All of this is related, weapons sales, the human rights impact of trade deals, grave violations experienced by indigenous peoples and other Colombians. It all leads to internal displacement and to refugee flows and failing to take serious and meaningful steps to address that wider picture is a failure to respond to the human rights needs of Colombia's IDPs and refugees. That connection between the world community's failure to bring major human rights crises to an end and the inevitable consequences of massive internal displacement and refugee outflows is such an obvious one. That failure certainly haunts Syria's displaced millions, as it does along that border between Sudan and South Sudan, where again, global efforts to head off the crisis suffered from the same geopolitical logjam at the Security Council that has paralyzed efforts to deal with Syria. So no meaningful efforts to force the Sudanese to ground their Antonovs, no decisive steps to push Sudan to lift its humanitarian blockade of the region, not enough agreement to extend the leaky UN arms embargo that covers only Darfur to all of Sudan. Meanwhile, UN appeals to ensure that the UNHCR, WFP, and other agencies can rise to the enormous financial and logistical challenges of protecting refugees in some of the most isolated and harsh terrain in Africa remain disgracefully underfunded. And refugees like Hannah worry primarily about being uprooted one more time and even of being put more directly in harm's way. Well, the two must go hand in hand. The responsibility, the imperative of addressing grave human rights emergencies and the obligation to respond to the needs of refugees and ensure their safety. But the examples of disconnect between the two only grow. As I've already mentioned, that is certainly glaringly now the case in the Mediterranean where refugees hopeful of reaching safety in Europe are driven to increasingly desperate journeys to do so. Refugees fleeing crises that European governments have roundly condemned, often very publicly, but have powerlessly been unable to forestall. Refugees might be forgiven for imagining that those governments would therefore be positively inclined to those forced to flee from those very crises. And every year, thousands of people set off on perilous journeys in unseaworthy boats. They do so because other avenues for reaching refuge have largely been shut down, as European countries have increasingly focused on preventing people from setting foot in EU territory, regardless of the crisis they are fleeing. And the consequences are increasingly fatal. Over the past 20 years now, 20,000 refugees are said to have lost their lives making that perilous crossing. In 2011, the UNHCR estimates that at least 1,500 people died while trying to cross the Mediterranean and reach safety in Europe. Hundreds more died in 2013, including that one tragic sinking that claimed over 360 lives in early October off the Italian island of Lampedusa. And the human stories behind those numbers are wrenching. For example, in late March 2011, 72 people from a range of African nations, including Sudan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia, had left Libya by boat, hoping to reach Italy. Just remind yourself what was happening in Libya in March 2011. The boat quickly ran out of fuel, water, and food. Using a satellite phone, panicked people on board, reached an Eritrean priest in Italy. He notified the Italian Coast Guard and NATO. A military helicopter then lowered some water and biscuits by rope, but never returned. Fishing boats and military vessels passed by the stranded boat, but did nothing. 
people started to die and their bodies were lowered into the sea. Those still alive started to become delirious and jumped overboard. Eventually, the boat drifted back to Libya and only nine of the 72 who started the journey were still alive. Keeping refugees away has become a common global theme. It has made things particularly perilous for refugees who take to the open seas. Set out for Australia these days by sea and you will instead end up warehoused on any number of surrounding islands, locked up indefinitely and denied a full range of essential rights. Even though far greater numbers of refugees arrive in Canada by land or by air, far greater, there is an almost pathological fear about refugees who might come by sea. It is incredible the degree to which that fixation has, for instance, fueled some of the worst refugee forms we've ever seen in Canada. The mandatory detention and other mean-spirited and punitive provisions enacted in 2012, targeting what are termed irregular arrivals. And that fixation on the open waters is not limited to Western governments. In March last year, the Thai Navy opened fire on a ship carrying Rohingya refugees from Burma who were trying to reach Malaysia. As many of you may know, persecution of the Rohingya people in Burma's Arkan state has spilled over into some of the worst violence and abuse the region has seen in years. Their boat, again, had run out of fuel while passing through Thai waters. The 130 people on board were taken into custody on the ship. Thai sailors opened fire when a group of 20 Rohingya panicked while they were being transferred to a Thai patrol boat, and at least two of the Rohingya were killed. What has been particularly troubling is the number of instances when refugees who are fleeing such obvious and compelling situations of human rights abuse, like the Rohingya fleeing Burma, have, flaced, have faced violence and abuse rather than safety and protection. The agonies faced by Eritrean refugees in that regard is particularly glaring. One of the most repressive countries in the world, last year Eritrea marked a cruelly ironic 20th anniversary of independence from Ethiopia. Ironic because independence was supposed to be the beginning of an era of freedom and justice, and instead it began a descent into tyranny and relentless cruelty. One might expect, therefore, a particularly compassionate and generous approach to Eritrean refugees. Not the case at all. In fact, Eritrean refugees face seemingly insurmountable challenges in finding safety anywhere. So many have died in those boats in the Mediterranean, and last year, we put out a wrenching report documenting the horrific mistreatment of refugees from Eritrea as they pass by land through Sudan and then Egypt on their way to seeking safety further afield. They are kidnapped from camps in Sudan, forcibly transported to Egypt, severely abused in the Sinai Desert where they are held captive by criminal gangs who seek ransom from their families. Many have been murdered when families are unable to come up with the exorbitant ransoms demanded. Others die because of the intolerably brutal conditions and treatment they are forced to endure. Neither Sudan nor Egypt have to date taken any efforts to tackle this crisis, to rein in the gangs and ensure that Eritreans receive the protection that is their due under international human rights law. Well, I look out and see a lot of very cheery faces. <laughs> and I know that's quite a long lament from me about how the human rights side of refugee protection is increasingly abandoned. Let me end then with the flip side. What does a human rights-based approach to refugee protection entail? And I'm going to keep it at a very high level here. I want to touch on six broad themes to consider. First, and this, you'll, you heard all of this in those stories, first we need to start talking again about root causes, about more meaningfully tackling the human rights violations that cause refugees to flee and then stand in the way of them returning home. 
That means protecting the rights of women and girls, tackling impunity for human rights violations, reining in the arms trade, ensuring companies are accountable for their human rights impact, that trade policy pays attention to human rights, and more. This is the integral essential link between human rights protection and refugee protection. Protecting refugees avoids and prevents human rights violations, but preventing and ending human rights violations is the ultimate goal in refugee protection. Second, we must tackle the poisonous rhetoric about refugees as undeserving cheats, liars, and criminals. All of us, every single one of you here in the room tonight has the power to do something about this tomorrow or next week or three weeks from now. It is easy to let those pejorative terms slide past. We read them, we hear them all the time. Economic refugees, queue jumpers, bogus refugees, undeserving. But every time we do let it slide, the support for refugees slips one more notch. An understanding of their needs and their rights erodes one more inch. Interrupt and push back. Write a letter to the editor, send an email to government, challenge and refute. We need to make it clear that the talk of bogus refugees is plain and simple bogus. Third. Strengthen international solidarity. No state should go it alone, either in closing its doors to refugees or in taking up the burden and responsibility of responding to a mass influx of refugees and protecting their rights. That used to be more of a hallmark of global responses to refugee crises. Think back, for instance, to the way states, led by Canada, in fact, in the mid-80s, we won a prestigious UN medal for this, and that was the response to the Indo-Chinese refugee crisis 35 years ago. But increasingly, it is a unilateral world. States close their doors through law, through practice, unilaterally. They fail to step up and work together to offer necessary financial and resettlement assistance to frontline states struggling to cope. It is time for a renewal of a shared understanding that protecting the rights of refugees is a collective responsibility. It does not rest only on the shoulders of the closest neighboring country, and it cannot be avoided simply by those countries prosperous or ruthless enough to have the resources and infrastructure to keep refugees at bay. Fourth, put an end to refugee policy that is driven by punishment and deterrence. A state's preoccupation should not rest only in how to deter refugees from coming, how to turn them away, how to punish them and make them regret coming if they do make it through all the barriers. A state's first question should be, how do we ensure that the rights of refugees are protected? What more can we do? How we want for leadership on that front. Next, commit to equality. Refugees do not deserve more or less justice depending on where they come from or where they have ended up. They do not deserve to be excluded from justice because they are displaced. They do not deserve less rights because they came in a group or relied on a smuggler, and they certainly do not deserve less or no health care because they are refugees. And then finally, how about putting refugees themselves, and I'm thinking of Hannah's words in Yida camp, their needs and fears, their experience and expertise, their capabilities and their determination at the heart of refugee policy, empowered and involved, not sidelined and ignored, goes far in protecting rights, but you know, it also goes far in finding solutions that matter and solutions that last. Tous les êtres humains naissent libres et égaux en dignité et en droit. All human beings, free and equal, dignity and rights. Thank you very much.
Uh, I've, I've lost track of time, uh, but I'm assuming we do still have some time for uh, any reflections, reaction, questions. It's over to you, and I understand there's a microphone over there. <laughs> We're going to watch you make the journey. Hello. Uh, that was a great speech, by the way. Um, so my question was more, I guess I'm trying to wrap up everything together. So as we've noticed, it seems like a lot of the issues dealing with the refugee policies is the fact that the human right issues are kind of put to the back burner rather than the central... Uh, issue at hand. So I was wondering how do we take away, like with the quote you had mentioned about the arms to Colombia, how do we take away that as our point of reference and make the human rights issue something to the forefront when considering policies? Right. Uh, well, obviously, I mean, I, I kept my six points at a very broad level, and there's lots. There's ample uh, tasks and campaigns and legal challenges and, uh, and other streams of work that lie in all of those areas. I think with respect to that first point, the need to really once, and this is nothing new, I'm no, I'm no prophet in saying, wow, human rights violations and refugee displacement are linked and we got to get a handle on that. That has been part of refugee advocacy for years and years and years, although it uh, does seem in many respects that it's subsided lately. We've kind of, we aren't paying as much attention to that link or talking as much about that link. But I think for those of us, those of you whose passion lies there, uh, then absolutely, uh, you know, think of doing that broad human rights work as, yes, it's broad human rights work, but it also is refugee work. Being able to push on some of those issues in Colombia, uh, and I think Colombia is a great one to emphasize because it's very real, it's very connected to us as Canadians. Colombia is a foreign policy priority for our country. There's a whole variety of ways in which our relationship is deepening, including in ways that if none done, not done properly, stand to exacerbate, not improve human rights problems. Uh, so we absolutely should consistently be looking for ways to press the Canadian government to be pushing a human rights reform agenda in that increasingly influential relationship, uh, not ignoring and sidelining and turning a back uh, on those human rights issues. That comes through advocacy, it comes through being in touch with your MP, it comes through writing letters to the editor, linking up with the many other organizations, there's Latin American groups, trade union groups, human rights groups, uh, on and on, uh, Colombian um, exiles in Canada who are very active around that. Um, there may be times when we turn creatively to the courts uh, to try to push some of those issues, especially the ways in which human rights against the law, really, are being kind of left to the side in that trade deal. Uh, but um, that's, that's all human rights work, but it also really is a crucial piece of work with respect to refugees and IDPs. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thanks so much. Um, for the past 18 months, I've been working on and following the inter interim federal health program changes fairly closely, um, and I know that Doctors for Refugee Care are working with lawyers to actually make a legal case. Yeah, they've, um, they've been in court uh, just these last couple of weeks. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm wondering how do you think that will play out as far as um, those legal challenges and the government's response to that, and uh, where does this go from here? I know that um, pro bono clinics are popping up. Um, in a few cities in Canada, um, but the fear is that any any breath that the provincial or federal governments will get of these pro bono clinics that are helping refugees who are undocumented are going to be immediately shut down because it is contrary to what the um, current policy is. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a reasonable prospect with the court challenge. I know I haven't followed it very closely, but I do know a number of the lawyers who are, um, who are the, the applicants in the case. Uh, there's an immense amount of work that's gone into it, including some very solid work, as is always necessary in a case like this, to really build a strong evidentiary record. You can't go into a case 
like that into court with just sort of rhetoric and anecdotes. You really need to be able to demonstrate the impact of the cuts, the numbers, um, what kind of health crises have been provoked. Uh, and I know they feel that they've been able to do that very strongly. I did hear that there was sort of, uh, um, people were feeling fairly good about the kinds of questions the judge was asking of government lawyers. Um, I've long ago learned though that you predict judges at your peril. Uh, and you know, the, the number of times I've thought, I think back to my own lawyering days, that I had tanked, and then four weeks later I had a positive decision and, and seen the reverse prove out as well. So I, we really won't know until we see the decision. Uh, it's not the end, though. This is clearly something that will be appealed and could quite possibly go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. So that would be two more levels uh, of court uh, if it made it all the way through. And, uh, and that could mean two or three more years, or even longer, depending on how long this current case goes on. Um, but, um, but I think, I mean, in the current climate, I think quite rightly, people, there was a, as you likely know, there was an immense amount of campaigning that had happened, and I think pointing to the role that doctors have played is a really notable one. I mean, doctors were marching on Parliament Hill and not about OHIP fees. <laughs> they were marching, uh, you know, a lot of integrity, a lot of deep, deep concern. I've spoken with many of those doctors and, and they get very emotional about this, the kinds of cases they've seen and, and the ways in which they think sort of fundamental, crucial principles around medical care are being decimated uh, by this policy. Uh, but ultimately, all of that campaigning didn't budge uh, the government, we're stuck with the cuts, and so I think the courts right now are the best option, and let's keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. Okay. I had a question as to whether uh, yourself or Amnesty has have any policies or, or thoughts on how to resolve the Palestinian refugee issue within the context of the current uh, Israel-Palestine peace negotiations. The Palestinians, see, I think, make up one, one quarter, 25-30% uh, of, the, of the designated refugees in the world, and they have a, this special status uh, to enjoy a right, right to return, which is obviously controversial. And all their descendants are also recognized as refugees, and there's a specific UN organization that's uh, supposed to be working on their behalf and resolving the problem. But uh, how, how do you think it can be resolved within the context of the current negotiations? I guess Secretary Kerry in his framework agreement may put forward some sort of combination, no complete right to return, but maybe a, a, a qualified one for a few designated uh, people, plus compensation, plus, I suppose, uh, uh, the creation of a Palestinian state that would have the capacity to absorb some of the Palestinian diaspora and, and possibly um, resettlement. But does Amnesty have any, uh, have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Uh, well, I wish I had the magic solution. Uh, I clearly don't. Our, our position on this is, is a strong, firm human rights one, and that is we do uh, call for and endorse the right of return uh, fully. Um, it's not our role and our place to be the one who then enters into negotiations as to how much of that right, um, you know, should be negotiated away or uh, you know, what other kinds of measures, like the ones you've, um, you've addressed around uh, uh, compensation or, or settlement somewhere else in a Palestinian state, etc. Those are all very real possibilities. The voice we'll continue to bring to it is, and I think that's an important role for, because you need a whole variety of voices reminding states of various perspectives and principles and dimensions of the crisis, and ours will be that in our view, and there are differing views even within the international human rights community, but the position Amnesty has taken, uh, and it was long and carefully taken, uh, is that international law does guarantee a full right of return. All right.
So if we could actually ask Catherine as well to, to remain on the stage. Um, on behalf of the Conflict Studies and Human Rights Student Association, the Faculty of Social Sciences, and SIPS, the Center for International Policy Studies, we would like to thank Alex Nee for his presentation and participation in this event. Um, on behalf of CHRA, we would like to thank um, both of these guests up on the stage for their present a uh, small token of our thanks. We appreciate greatly the work of Amnesty International and present a donation as well. I would also like to thank the Fragile Research States Network, the Center for International Policy Studies, and the Faculty for Social Sciences, as well as all the volunteers of CHRA that contributed to this event. Please join us for cocktails and light refreshments that will be served momentarily in a fruitful follow-up discussion. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.